Following his practice of taking the message of peace to all world leaders, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih V was welcomed to the Parliament buildings, the seat of the New Zealand government at the capital, Wellington. Hazrat Khalifatul Masih addressed the members of the government in the Grand Hall of the Parliament House. Attending the event were members of Parliament, city councilmen, professors, police commissioners and many foreign consul generals, high commissioners and ambassadors, including the Ambassador for Israel and Iran, and representatives from the British and Cuban High Commission. The event was arranged by Honorable Kalwaljeet Singh Bakshi, MP. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace, mercy and blessings of God be upon all of you. We'd like to start the formal part of this function. It's um, fairly concise. We will begin with the recitation of the Holy Quran in accordance with Islamic tradition, which will be performed by our central missionary, Mulana Shafiqur Rahman Shahid. Following that, I will do a quick introduction, and then there will be the keynote address by His Holiness, Mirza Masroor Ahmed. So may I now invite Mulana Shafiqur Rahman Shahid to please recite a portion of the Holy Quran with translation. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قوامين لله شهداء بالقط وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا اِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ وعد الله الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وعملوا الصالحات لهم مغفرة وأجر عظيم. I have recited verses number nine and ten of chapter number five of the Holy Quran. I would now present the English translation of these verses. Almighty God says, O ye who believe, be steadfast in the cause of the Almighty Allah, bearing witness in equity. And let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. Be always just, that is, nearer to righteousness, and fear Allah. Surely, Allah is aware of what you do. Allah has promised those who believe and do good deeds that they shall have forgiveness and a great reward. Thank you very much. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كي أتاو تيرانغي ماري ميتي أروهنوي أو الله أو تياتوا ميتانا منا كي كي أكوتو إيرونغا يتينغوا أو الله تياتوا تينو أتفاي أو تياتوا توهو مواكي تونواتو إن أمانا إن أريو رو رانغا تيرا ما تينا كوتو تينا كوتو تينا تاتو كتوا most respected Supreme Head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community, His Holiness Mirza Masroor Ahmed, the host, Member of Parliament, Honorable Kamaljeet Singh Bakshi, Members of Parliament, Councillors, Dignitaries and Distinguished Guests. On behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community, I would like to thank you all for coming to this function. Please accept our very warm welcome and profound salutation of peace. I would like to introduce the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and His Holiness, who is our principal guest speaker today. 
The Ahmadiyya Muslim community was founded in 1889 by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad He claimed to be the long-awaited Messiah that was prophesied to unite mankind in the latter days. With the true and peaceful teachings of Islam, underpinned by our motto, love for all and hatred for none, as the core message, our community has become the most dyna dynamic and the fastest growing revival movement within Islam. Today, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is established in over 200 countries with membership exceeding tens of millions. We believe that God sent Ahmad to end religious wars, condemn bloodshed, and reinstitute morality, justice, and peace. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is the leading Islamic organization to categorically reject terrorism in any form. The founder of the Ahmadiyya community taught his followers to protect the sanctity of both religion and government by becoming righteous souls as well as loyal citizens. Our community in New Zealand was established in 1987. Under the guidance of our current Caliph, His Holiness Mirza Masroor Ahmed, we were most fortunate to inaugurate our first mosque in New Zealand last week. At the same time, we were able to launch the full translation of the Holy Quran in Te Reo Māori. Through his guidance, our community in New Zealand has engaged in many external projects aside from numerous internal initiatives. Some of the external projects include providing financial support to the families of the Pike River Mines disaster. We also sent working parties to help clean up the liquefaction in the streets of Christchurch following the earthquake, and our community was at the forefront in raising funds to go towards the Christchurch earthquake appeal. Our community, aside from these internal um, initiatives, we have continuously raised funds to assist the rehabilitation of disaster-struck areas overseas. Over the last few years, we have been working with the New Zealand Immigration Services at the Refugee Centre to assist with the Migrant Resettlement Programme. Also, for the last few years, we have been working very closely with the Royal New Zealand Foundation of the Blind and have held charity walks to raise funds for them. It is now my privilege to introduce His Holiness, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed. He is the fifth Caliph of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Elected to this lifelong position in 2003, he serves as the worldwide spiritual and administrative head of the community. His Holiness is the world's leading Muslim figure promoting peace and interreligious harmony. Through his sermons, lectures, books, and personal meetings, His Holiness has continuously advocated the worship of God Almighty and serving humanity. He also continuously advocates for the establishment of universal human rights, a just society, and separation of religion and state. In June 2012, His Holiness made the keynote address at a special reception held at Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. In front of a packed audience, including more than 35 congressmen, His Holiness called on the American leaders to follow a path of peace based on justice and equality. Then, in December 2012, His Holiness addressed the European Parliament in Brussels. There, he called on the European leaders to preserve their unity and to follow a path of equality, tolerance, and compassion. May I most humbly invite His Holiness to kindly address us, please. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the gracious, ever merciful. All the distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessing of Allah be upon you all. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of those people who have organized especially the Honorable Member of Parliament who has organized this event and given me the opportunity to address to all of you today. Secondly, I would like to thank all of you 
who have come to hear, uh, come here to listen to me. <clears throat> of course, in this parliament, parliament house, the various politicians and members of parliament regularly meet to develop policies and plans and to enact legislation, all aimed at making the nation progress. Apart from this, I'm sure many of uh, many secular or worldly leaders will have come here and addressed you based on their knowledge, expertise, and past experience. However, rarely, if ever, will you have been addressed by the head of a religious community, and in particular, a Muslim leader. Thus, for you to give me the opportunity to address you as the worldwide head of, head of the Amdiya Muslim community, which is a purely Islamic organization and whose sole objective is to spread the true teachings of Islam is a sign of your open-heartedness uh, and your very high levels of uh, tolerance. Therefore, I am obliged to thank you for this kind gesture. With these words of thanks, I would now like to move on to the main part of my address and say a few things about Islam's beautiful teachings. I will speak about that issue, which in my opinion is the critical need of the time, and that is the establishment of world peace. From a secular perspective, many of you, both politicians at an indi individual level and the government collectively, are making efforts towards achieving peace. Your efforts will be motivated by a good intent, and you will have enjoyed some success in these efforts. Also, over the years, your government will have given advice to other major powers about the means to develop a peaceful and harmonious world. No doubt, the state and circumstances of the world today are extremely precarious and are causing a great deal of concern to the entire world. Whilst some of the major conflicts today are taking place in the Arab world, the truth is that any wise or intelligent person will be aware that such conflicts will not remain limited to just that region. There is no doubt that a conflict between a government and its people can escalate into a much broader international conflict. Already we find that two blocks amongst the major powers are forming. One block supports the Syrian government, whilst the other is supporting the rebel forces. And so clearly, this situation is not merely a grave threat to the Muslim countries, but is also a source of extreme danger for the rest of the world. We should never forget the heart-wrenching experience of the two world wars that occurred during the last century. The sheer devastation that they caused, in particular the Second World War, was unprecedented. Just through the use of 
conventional weapons, heavily populated and thriving towns and cities were utterly demolished and left in absolute ruin and millions were killed. Further, during the Second World War, the world witnessed the truly devastating event when the atom bomb was used against Japan, causing such annihilation that just hearing of its effects, may, uh, of its effects makes a person tremble and shudder. The museum in Hiroshima and Nagasaki are sufficient reminder of the horrors and utter devastation that took place. During the Second World War, around 70 million people were killed, and it's said that 40 million of those who died were civilians. Thus, more civilians sacrificed their lives than military personnel. Further, the aftermath of the war was truly terrifying, whereby the post-war related deaths ran into millions. For many years after the nuclear bombs were used, radiation continued to have a terrible degenerative effect on newborn children. In today's world, even some small nations have come to possess nuclear weapons, and their leaders are trigger happy. It seems they do not care about the destruction or destructive consequences of their actions. And so if we imagine a nuclear war occurring today, the picture painted leaves a person shaken and utterly petrified. The atom bomb possessed by smaller nations today are perhaps even more powerful than those that were used during the Second World War. And so this climate of conflict and instability can only cause great concern to those people who wish to establish peace in the world and who are working towards it. The pathetic situation of today's world is that at one level, people speak of establishing peace, whilst at another level, they are engulfed in their egotistical ways and wrapped by a shroud of pride and arrogance. In order to prove their superiority and might, every powerful government is ready to make all possible efforts. After the Second World War, in an effort to establish long-lasting peace in the world, and to prevent future wars, nations joined together to form an organization, which they called the United Nations. However, it seems that just as the League of Nations miserably failed in, the objectives, in its objectives, the status and respect of the United Nations continues to fall by the day. If the requirements of justice are not fulfilled, then no matter how many organizations are formed the sake of, for the sake of peace, their efforts will prove fruitless. I have just mentioned the failure of the League of Nations. The institution was formed after the First World War with the sole objective of safeguarding world peace. However, it could not stop the onset of Second World War, which, as I have already said, caused so much devastation and loss. New Zealand also suffered casualties as a result of the war. It is said that it suffered a loss of around 11,000 people, virtually all of whom were from the military. As New Zealand was far removed from the epicenter of the war, it did not suffer civilian casualties. 
However, as I have already alluded to, overall in the war, more innocent civilians were killed than military personnel. Just imagine normal innocent people, including countless women and children, were killed indiscriminately, having committed no crime. It is for this very reason that you will find in the hearts of the people who live in countries which were directly engulfed in that war and an innate hatred of war itself. Certainly, it is a requirement of loving one's nation that if it is ever attacked, it is the duty of a citizen to be ready to give every sacrifice for its defense and to liberate the nation. Nevertheless, if the conflict can be resolved in a cordial or peaceful way through negotiations and diplomacy, then one should not needlessly invite death and killings. In olden times, when wars took place, there were mainly military casualties with a very minimum civilian loss. However, the means of today's war include aerial bombardment, poison gas, and even chemical weapons. And as I said, there is also the potential use of the most horrific weapon of all, the nuclear bomb. Consequently, the wars of today are entirely different to those of the past. Because today wars could potentially wipe mankind from the face of the earth. Let me at this point present a beautiful teaching of the Holy Quran regarding the establishment of peace. The Quran says, and good and evil are not alike. Repel evil with that which is best. And lo, he between whom and thyself was enmity will become as thou he were a warm friend. Thus the Quran teaches that as far as possible, any enmities or grudges should be reconciled and solved by opening the channels of communication and through dialogue. Most certainly to speak to someone with kindness and wisdom can only have a very positive and enduring effect on their heart and is a matter, uh, means of removing hatred and grudges. No doubt we in this era believe ourselves to be extremely advanced and civilized. We have created various international charities and foundations that provide health care and education to children or that provide health care to mothers. Similarly, there are countless other charities established out of human sympathy and compassion. We have done all of this we who have done all of this should reflect and pay attention to the urgent need of the time and contemplate how we can save ourselves and others from devastation and destruction. We should remember that compared to six or seven decades ago, the world is now much closer together. 60 or 70 years ago, New Zealand was a distant country, far away from Asia and Europe. However, today it is an integral part of one common global community. Thus, in a state of war, no country and no region is safe. Your leaders and your politicians are the guardians of the nation. They are responsible for the safety of the country and for its continued progress and betterment. And so it is essential that they always keep in mind the critical point that it is from 
local wars, that devastation and destruction spreads far and wide. We should be grateful to God that he recently granted sense and wisdom to some of the major powers so that they realized that they had to take action to stop war, to prevent the utter devastation that would have ensued. Most pertinently, Russia's president made efforts to hold back some of the other major powers from attacking, attacking Syria. He made it clear that all countries, whether large or small, should be treated equally. He also said that if the requirements of justice were not met, and if other nations went to war independently, then the United Nations would suffer the same sorry fate as the League of Nations. I believe that he was completely correct in this analysis. Although I am not a supporter of all of his policies or Israel's policies, but when there is a word of wisdom, we should accept it. I wish only that he had gone one step further and said that the right of veto power held by five permanent members of UN Security Council should be ended once and for all so that true justice and equity could prevail amongst all nations. Last year I was given the opportunity to make an address at Capitol Hill in Washington. The audience included numerous senators, congressmen, think tank, representatives of and uh, many other education, educated people from various fields. I clearly said to them that the requirements of justice are only fulfilled when all parties and all people are treated equally. I said to them that if you want to highlight the differences between the large and small countries and the rich and poor nations, and if you want to maintain the injustice of veto power, then restlessness and anxiety will certainly develop. Indeed, such, such anxieties have already begun to show their faces in the world. And so, as the head of the worldwide Muslim community, it is my duty that I should draw the attention of the world towards establishing peace. I consider this my obligation because Islam's very meaning is peace and security. If certain Muslim countries carry out or promote hate-filled acts of extremism, it should not lead to the conclusion that Islamic teachings promote disorder or strife. I have just quoted a verse of the Holy Quran and then within it is a lesson of how to establish peace. Furthermore, the founder of Islam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught his followers to always give salam, meaning to always spread the message of peace. We know from his blessed example that he would invoke peace to all non-Muslims, be they Jews, Christians, or the people of any other faith or beliefs. He did so because he understood that all people formed part of God's creation. And because one of God's name, names is the source of peace. And so he desires peace and security for all of mankind. I have mentioned some of Islam's teachings in relation to peace, but I should clarify that due to the lack of time, I have mentioned only a few aspects. In truth, Islam is filled with commandments and teachings advocating peace and security for all people. And in relation to establishing justice, what does the Quran say? In chapter 5, which was recited just now, it says, O ye who believe, be steadfast in the cause of Allah, bearing witness in equity 
and let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. Be always just, that is nearer to righteousness, and fear Allah. Surely Allah is aware of what you do. And so, in this verse, the Quran outlines the very highest possible standards of justice. This commandment leaves no room for people who call themselves Muslim yet to commit atrocities and brutalities. Neither does it leave any room for criticism from those people who consider or seek to portray Islam as a violent and extremist religion. The Quran has further laid down the most exemplary standards of justice and fairness. It has not only said to be just, but in fact advocates equity to such an extent that it states, O ye who believe, be strict in observing justice and be witness for Allah, even though it be against yourselves or against your kindred. Whether he against whom witness is born, be rich or poor, Allah is more regardful of them both than, of, uh, of them both than you are. Therefore, do not follow your low desires that you may be able to act equitably. And if you hide the truth or evade it, then know that Allah is well aware of what you do. And so it is such principled standard of justice that establish peace in the world, from the most basic element of society all the way through the international arena. History testifies to the fact that the founder of Islam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, acted upon this teaching and spread it to all corners. And now, in this era, the true devotee of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who was the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat or community, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadiyan, spread and championed this teaching and instructed his followers to also spread peace. He further instructed his followers to draw the attention of mankind towards fulfilling both the rights of God and the rights of God's creation. It is for this reason that the Ahmadiyya community emphasizes to, to all people the critical need of fulfilling the rights of Allah and of his creation and of establishing the very best standards of justice. It is my prayer that every single one of us, irrespective of religion or belief, pays heed towards fulfilling each other's due rights so that the world can become a heaven of peace and harmony. With these few words, I conclude and I thank you again for inviting me and coming here to listen to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Your Holiness. Uh, it's our privilege to have him here today in Parliament. Can I thank you all for coming today and listen to his uh, wisdom? And uh, it's great, great to have his thoughts. I have been working with the MDA community for almost last 10 years, and I have always found that uh, the main aim of this organization has been to bring peace and work with the interfaith uh, council and different religions. Uh, I thank you, Iqbal, for giving us this opportunity of bringing His Holiness to Parliament, and uh, it's a real opportunity for us to listen his wisdom. Uh, we have got about 10 minutes. If anybody has got any question, you can uh, ask His Holiness uh, anything if you got any, any clarifications required.
No? That's very good, wonderful. Oh, answered, all right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I take this opportunity to uh, thank particularly my parliamentary colleagues, uh, Dr. Rajen Prasad and Dr. Cam Calder, who have specially flown from Auckland to uh, listen this lecture, and obviously the ambassador of Israel, Cuba, Iran, also present here today, and other members of the diplomatic care, core. So thank you very much for uh, having us today, uh, coming over and listening to His Holiness. The food is being served, and His Holiness will be leaving around 1.30. He has got an appointment with the minister, and uh, meanwhile, mix and mingle is an opportunity to talk to him. Thank you very much. Yeah, if anybody wants to come and share anything, you are most welcome to, because we've got some time. Uh, your thoughts, Doctor? Sir? Uh, yes. Your Holiness, a special welcome to you to Parliament on behalf of the opposition and uh, our leader, David Cunliffe, who for all kinds of reasons is unable to be here. Uh, and it's a pleasure for us to, to welcome you and to acknowledge also our Ahmadiyya friends, and I have friends in the, in the community, and others who have come from the Diplomatic Corps and friends from Wellington. Um, my observation, I was born in Fiji, and I've been here almost 50 years now, uh, uh, Fiji also has a strong Ahmadiyya community, and, and we have lots of friends uh, in that community. And uh, I am always been impressed with the way they lead their lives um, as, as true friends of, of the nation and of different faiths, uh, but also uh, reflecting your message, Your Holiness, the, of, of peace, uh, because there's nothing stronger than that message of peace. And it's amazing how difficult it is to get that message through in today's world. Because as Your Holiness reflected, it's, um, it's honored more in its breach than in, in respect for peace. So every, every message you give is, uh, is important. Um, this parliament is a very special place. And this parliament has, has a strong tradition of standing for what is right. And my, my colleagues, uh, Colonel Jeet and Cam Calder and I respect, uh, and our, our parties and our colleagues internalize that notion of peace. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's good to hear it again. Um, and it's good to remind us that not only are we talking about world peace, but we're talking about peace in our communities, peace amongst our women, peace amongst our, our children, and, and peace uh, uh, amongst those who are less fortunate than ourselves, so we can extend that message as well. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful reflection of, of, of that piece. I, I want to acknowledge uh, Ahmadiyya leaders uh, uh, in Auckland for the very special work you do and for how you've gone about building your first mosque. And I wasn't able to be there for its opening the other day for our party conference was on in Wellington. Um, but know that uh, we will be there to support you and I know our colleagues from both sides of the house will be there for you as well. Uh, Your Holiness, you are most welcome in New Zealand. You are most welcome in this parliament, along with uh, our friends who are here as well. And thank you also for coming and, and uh, honouring His Holiness, uh, showing our respect for the Ahmadiyya community. And thank you for being here. Norera tēnā koto kato.
I think that it was a very uh, important message and I think that it is a message that can be welcomed and accepted by, by, by everyone. We're talking about peace and who can oppose peace? And I think that the message that he had spoken, the perspective that he has given is extremely important. And of course, uh, the way that he condemns violence is extremely important for all, those, all of us, all over the world, who have seen violence, who have suffered from violence. And uh, all I can say is make a wish that uh, his wisdom, his message will be really become a reality the sooner the better. Well, I think peace is everybody's business. Uh, a lack of peace in one part of the world means that the world is an unhappy place. And if we are to address peace in one part of the world, then we have to address the same situation elsewhere as well. I think that's the message I'll take. Um, and the, and the, um, the second one is the symbolism of him being here. I think that's quite important. Well, it's very inspirational. Um, I, uh, I came here not really knowing what to expect. Uh, I knew a little bit about the, His Holiness and the message he has, but I found it very inspirational. It was great to join a, a number of people from New Zealand across various communities, to meet some people from Britain as well, which was great, and to hear a message which I found really inspirational. Uh, it's a real message that needs to get out to people in this world of ours today.